lies When you're gonna quit spitting quoting academic fabulists in their daily remonstrations The lies behind the reasons why you show up to oppose legit demonstrations How can you fight the fight if you can't see the lights? Hello, I am the OBG with the microphone and welcome to the OBG show. Tonight, I've got some serious stuff. I've even got the glasses on and um, I'm just going to get straight into it. So, we're in phase two of the lockdown in the UK anyway. And, you know, globally, they're trying to implement it. And this second lockdown is the next phase in shutting down small independent businesses and killing off the livelihoods of many. And it also ushers in universal income, something that have been tested by insidious opinion polls over many years. So let's get into the details. But before I do, remember, the police cannot enter your home under tier two or one and three regulations. They do not have the power and they would have to be invited or they'd have to have a warrant in order to enter your home to disperse gatherings. So have your little get together still, don't let them in and just tell them there's six people in the house. Anyway, this lockdown, um, as part of the coronavirus pandemic, has accelerated the implementation of the plans to establish a new world order. And that's a fact, under the auspices of the World Economic Forum, the WEF, global policy makers are advocating for a great reset with the intention of creating a global technocracy. Now, for those of you who don't know these terms, a technocracy is a government or social system that's controlled by technicians, especially scientists and technical experts. And the growth in scientism over the years, along with our trust in technology, has certainly made this easier as we dribble over scientific law and lord the tech billionaires for their financial worth over their invasive um, self-serving creations. Now, these schoolboy dreams, they manifest the idea of global governance with the source of control. Typically, you know, like the image of someone sat at the terminal with the ability to call up information about any single citizen, to money citizens, to cut off their payments, to censor their access to information and to each other, and to remove their access to each other for minor infractions. Viva la technology, <laughs> not. Now, picture this. As happens every now and then, and, you know, in the world of crime, and let's take the Italian mafia in the USA as an example, because we've all heard of them. The heads of the mobs and the US intelligence services, occasionally they'd meet up and they'd collude on a project. It could be anything from taking out somebody, for example, the president, as has happened, or opening new illegal trade routes. And this is what's happening here in our world today. The US, China, Russia, Europe, North Korea, they've come together for a meeting of the mobs to implement a global strategy that's going to affect each and every one of us. And they've been paving the way by systematically destroying countries that would not have taken part and have installed new leaders in those countries that are going to do their bidding. And for those countries and continents that don't truly offer uh, any opposition, such as India and Africa, you know, they'll be won over under the guise of doing trade with them while simply investing in large scale projects that benefit those stakeholders from abroad. Now, this new technocracy is a collusion of governments funded by tech giants and the heads of the digital industry. And it's very likely well planned with advice from their corrupt economic advisors and they have programs for a minimal uh, or a minimum universal income likely in the form of digital currency something that we're moving towards healthcare and no doubt that they're working on methods to keep the leviathans that sell online amazon etc doing business maintaining the divide between rich and poor businesses now i spoke some time ago about the idea that we can be replaced and there isn't a need for us human beings as a labor force anymore. Now just entertain this idea. They've captured our digital essence, what we eat, what we drink, who we talk to, and they have all our address books after all, what we like to wear, our habits, even our predictions and what we think. Now, with AI, they can reproduce us. So stick with me. <laughs> and the avatars that appear on their screens needn't be a real person anymore. They can simulate us and our interactions. It's like a big computer game to them. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> Robots and AI have taken over many jobs. Self-driving cars, trucks, drones, service robots that can even prepare and deliver orders from household goods to food, both fresh and pre-made takeaways. In short, we're a burden. They see us as savages that need to be controlled and exploited. <laughs> Now, Thomas Hobbes, I spoke about him before, um, he published Le 
Leviathan in 1651, and in it he argues that civil peace and social unity are best achieved by establishment of a commonwealth through social contract. And he argues that a sovereign power is responsible for protecting the security of the Commonwealth and granted absolute authority to ensure the common defence. And he starts Leviathan off by saying the Commonwealth is an artificial person that as a body politic mimic the human body. Now he pretty much sums up the philosophy of Leviathan in the first of these four books um, titled Of Man. And in this Hobbes argues that every aspect of human nature can be deduced from materialist principles. And materialism that's like a form of philo philosophical monism that holds that matter is a fundamental substance in nature and that all things, including mental states and consciousness, are material. And monism is about the attribution of, um, you know, like oneness or things as, you know, just as a single unit. Now, when Hobbes wrote Leviathan during the English Civil War and at a time when the Republic was at its strongest, his book advocated for the restoration of monarchy and even challenged the very basis of philosophical and political knowledge. Now, I talk about these topics in a previous show about the will, where I discuss the mind-body problem, dualism and monism. So go back to the OBG show page and OBG show group and you can see those shows. Anyway, I reckon every person who claims to have authority over us has given it a good read and agree with what it expresses. That civil war... And the brute situation of a state of nature, the war of all against all, as Thomas Hobbes calls it, could be avoided by strong, undivided government. So in order to control us, they're going to implement and control a universal credit system. They'll control what we see. They'll control what we hear. They'll control what we do. And our identities will be taken away. If we don't comply, then we're going to lose our privileges. And this would mean no travelling, no contact, and of course penalties in the form of no pay. Now, what is their agenda? A little history is required on this. So, I talked about a uh, European um, who people considered a great statesman when I went into detail about Pericles, a Greek statesman and general of Athens during its golden age. And you can hear more about that if you look for the OBG show that I did on the 17th of September this year. And he was largely responsible for the full development in the later 5th century BC of both the Athenian democracy and the Athenian empire, which made Athens a political and cultural epicenter of Greece. And there's not a single story about genocide of takeovers to be found and he was well loved so in our time the people behind control and the great reset are an elite group of businessmen and politicians along with their intellectual cohorts and at the helm is the founder klaus schwab who is the architect of the great reset who stated that a great reset is necessary to build a new social contract that honors the dignity of every human being and he also said that the global health crisis has laid bare the unsustainability of our old system in terms of social cohesion and the lack of equal opportunities and inclusiveness and we can't turn our backs on the evils of racism and discrimination we need to build into this new social contract our intergenerational he, we need to build into this new social contract uh, intergenerational responsibility to ensure that we live up to the expectations of young people. Now, if these people weren't such fascists, because eight-year-old Klaus comes from, like, Nazi Germany, and these people are more interested in, you know, making sure that um, capitalists earn money, then it would be easy to take on board. But I'm not accepting that. Now, the fourth industrial revolution... And this is what they're calling it. And I've talked about this before, but I'm going to go over it very quickly, right? Um, the Fourth Industrial Revolution, which is 4IR, as it's known, is a way of um, describing our outreach into technology, where we merge beside and even physically something which Elon Musk is keen on with the digital world. A combination of the advances made in artificial intelligence, robotics, internet of things, 3D printing even, genetic engineering, quantum computing, and other new technologies. Now, the Fourth Industrial Revolution is sometimes called 4, capital I, and then capital R, or Industry 4.0. So imagine that human evolution is now being categorised and numbered. Anyway, they're claiming that it's set to change society like never before, and that it builds on foundations laid by the prior industrial revolutions. Now, I can imagine teams of specialists running computer programmes, you know, and they're feeding their computers with all the data related to previous revolutions, and then asking it daily, when will it happen? And then they're looking at their pretty graphs and charts, and the computer says, now's a good time. And these mad architects, they're just going for bust. Anyway... There were three prior industrial revolutions to these, and these were 
the Industrial Revolution, numero uno, which came about with the advent of the steam engine in the 18th century, allowing production to be mechanised for the first time. And this drove a massive social change, and it saw a massive growth from people becoming urbanised. Then... We had the second industrial revolution, which was driven by electricity and new scientific advancements, and this led to mass production, something they always grab hold of, and we're the labour force. Then, there was a third industrial revolution, which began in the start of the 1950s, in which the emergence of computers and digital technology came to the fore, which once again led to the increasing automation and manufacturing, and it was a disruptive technology, which had a direct impact on many industries, including banking, energy, and the communications. And now, in, you know, what I just explained, the fourth, which, if you ask me, seems a little bit contrived. It isn't naturally happening. It's planned by the technocrats. And guess who created the term for their shenanigans as a new revolution? Klaus Schwab, the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, and author of a book titled The Fourth Industrial Revolution. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> anyway, although he is noted for saying, like the revolution that preceded it, the Fourth Industrial Revolution has a potential to raise global income levels and improve the quality of life for populations around the world. I remain suspicious. So should you. Now, I'm going to talk a little about the World Economic Forum. Okay, sorry, I thought there was no one. No one's commenting. That's all. <laughs> We're not seeing any comments popping up. Um. Right. Okay. Never. Mind. I'm going to go straight on anyway. Let me just make sure this is working. Oh no. Maybe just bear with me one second, please. It is a live show. You're going to see a waltz and all. Um, there it is. Da -da -da -da. Let's see, okay, that's there now. That's fine. Let's lock that in place. Okay, now, um, you know what? I'm going to do a filler before I do the next section. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk about the World Economic Forum briefly, and this is part one of a series of four, which I'm going to do over the following weeks. So the World Economic Forum, uh, they were founded in 1971, and they used to congregate every January in Davos in Switzerland. Now, under the guidance of the uh, WEF, or the World Economic Forum, their agenda, which is a great reset, says that the completion of the current industrial transformation requires a thorough overhaul of the economy, politics and society, and that such a comprehensive transformation requires the alteration of human behaviour, and thus, transhumanism, once again, Elon Musk is part of their programme. And I'll talk about Elon Musk and transhumanism in a future show, where they try to meld us with machines and telling us it's good for us, and some people think it is, when it isn't. <laughs> right. So, the 51st meeting of the WEF is going to take place in Davos in 2021, where the agenda is about the commitment to move the world economy towards a more fair, sustainable and resilient future, whatever that entails. So, all these recent manoeuvres that we're being shuffled around in are simply a part of their great plan, the Great Reset. And the programme calls for, in their words, a new social contract that is centred on racial equality, social justice and the protection of nature. They're also claiming that climate change requires us to decarbonise the economy and to bring human thinking and human behaviour into harmony with nature. And their aim is to build more equal, inclusive and sustainable economics. And I don't think this is true. I think the uh, WF leaders, by the way, they also claim that this new world must uh, be urgently implemented, pointing out that the pandemic because I'm getting to the Corona Shimona, has laid bare the unsustainability of our system, which lacks social cohesion. So now, they're claiming that, and to me, it's, 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 it's uh, you know, contradiction in terms. One, they're claiming that, um, you know, there's no, there's no um, social cohesion because of the pandemic, but now they're not even connected and they're handling this pandemic very badly, it seems. And I was going to play some videos today, didn't have time to set them up, but there's a lot more people coming forward who are actually saying that there's the hospitals that they're working in, in key positions, are empty, or they've had very, very few cases, not the high numbers that people are telling us. So, as much as it kind of makes sense to aim to some of the goals that the WF are talking about, because it's not wrong with racial equality, social justice, and the protection of nature, 
forcing us into their programs without consultation as such is going to create fear. How can we trust people who are driven by profit for themselves in the main as individuals to run such a show? It's a move that they've been planning for years and they were initially aiming for 2030. However, somebody in their think tank came up with the coronavirus idea, giving them an excuse to accelerate the implementation. And the question on everyone's lips will be, who's going to be running things? And this is one of the most important factors. Even though we don't know all the names, it's going to be the new tech capitalists, scientists and economists that I talked about earlier. And I spoke many years ago about a power struggle at the top. And I really do believe it's going on. We all know the old school families that were running the world, funding wars, running banks, you know, the Rothschilds, Morgans and their underlings. But nothing lasts forever. And I think there was a grab for power internally, which resulted in us witnessing the sacrificing of some of the bigger plays in uh, corruption globally. And I truly believe that the new school ran away with the technology as a weapon and the uninformed old school were left behind with the old ideas and without the technical expertise. So maybe the new school do want to see changes for better. However, they still have an insidious plan for world domination of the lights that were never seen before. The old school had to wage wars and slay millions to make any ground. Whereas the technocrats have managed to silently enter our lives with their insidious surveillance methods and have captured the majority of the modern world without spilling blood. Now they've likely entered the lives of the old school and have many of them held by blackmail. That's a key thing. They also have everything they need to know about all but the, clever, uh, the clever, cleverest of us dissenters, allowing them to remove their enemies by all the usual methods and the modern methods of linking them to pornography or paedophilic images, which is a trivial task to send to anybody's computer or phone these days. Anyway, the whole idea of locking down the planet was to destroy the economies, both in business and families, which in David Icke's terms is problem, reaction, solution. And this is where they create a problem we react and then we turn to them for a solution, which in this case will be basal, uh, basic universal income. Now, also, there's also going to be a growth in the need for social assistance. And where would we be without mentioning the police? <laughs> Over the years, they've become more militarised and we've seen a massive growth in security services worldwide with G4S, an Israeli-based company, being the third largest employer of people in the world. And the problem here is that people still have the image of the village Bobby in their heads and they're going to sing the praises of that good copper they met once. And the reality is that they are human beings that follow orders. They have no loyalty to their oath, but only to their masters. And given an order to hurt, detain or even kill another human being, they will do that. We have to drop this title of police. They are wicked human beings, being corporate slaves who work for pay and they're slowly being funded by private organizations and they're going to show loyalty to whoever pays their wages and it's a simple and savage human choice their paymaster's orders are separate yourself from the people we're destroying stand above them protect us and we will house you we will clothe you and we will feed you and this in turn means that we will face a formidable force of well-equipped sycophants if we decide to fight back now, I think I've said enough on that, and I still haven't reached the juicy bits yet, but I'll do the next parts each Thursday, and there are three more parts planned, and then I change um, as the Rona shenanigans change. But before I stop, let me share with you a little about what's going on in other parts of Europe and the UK as we enter the second round of lockdown today. So two weeks ago, uh, France, they imposed a night curfew in Paris and other major cities to curb the spread of the coronavirus and new regulations and social distancing rules were introduced across multiple European countries in an attempt to stop the spread of the coronavirus as a second wave of the pandemic, which apparently accelerated across the continent. And the second wave idea is likely, is very likely just part two of their plan. Now, last week, Europe reported that more than 1.3 million new cases uh, occurred, which was its highest single week count yet, according to the World Health Organization, with Spain and France each surpassing 1 million cumulative confirmed cases, becoming the sixth and seventh countries to do so globally. Now, there are also record number increases in Italy, Germany, Belgium, Czech Republic and United Kingdom, threatening to overwhelm these countries uh, and their abilities uh, to test the coronavirus. Now, Many of the reports from hospital, hospitals, as I spoke earlier, from insiders are still appearing. And these people are saying they've put their necks on the line of giving their jobs up. And they're saying the figures are appallingly low. That their hospital, one woman who came out, she said there was only three people, even though it was reported as tons higher. Now, in Poland, their president, um, 
uh, Andre Duda, he tested positive for the virus recently, and they claim that the cases there doubled over the last few weeks of October. Also, the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control says that Europe's infection rate has been uh, rising for 90 days. And because the experts are worried that the situation in Europe may soon spin out of control, we're seeing new curfews and social restrictions as they attempt once again to curb the spread and avoid full-scale lockdown, which they say will result in damage to the economy for Christmas. No, it's just all about the spending, not a single mention of families and togetherness. And these are the stories they're telling us anyway. So here in Spain, the Prime Minister, uh, Pedro Sanchez, he declared a national state of emergency last Sunday, which included a night curfew and some travel restrictions between regions. And in Italy, they also announced uh, new measures to curb the virus. And this is a harsh, the harshest rise since its lockdown in spring, which were pretty harsh anyway. And that was due to Italy being the global epicenter of the pandemic at the time. And finally, in the UK, two weeks ago, the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, he announced a move to a high alert level. I don't know what the tier system is about in the UK, but um, this is something that I read earlier. So uh, they've raised it to that um, high, high level for London and other cities. And right now, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has announced a full lockdown, <laughs> which started today. Now, this is a massive U-turn by Boris Johnson. It's because um, with media uh, warnings of the grave economic fallout and amount of backlash um, from the uh, ruling Conservative Tory MPs, the Prime Minister announced that these new measures would come in today in order to combat growing coronavirus infections and will remain in place until December the 2nd. And once again, under these new measures, non-essential shops and venues, as well as pubs and restaurants, are going to be closed. Schools, colleges and universities, however, will remain open because the virus knows not to affect people in full-time education. Now, for everybody else, they can leave home for specific reasons, such as work, if they can't work from home, to shop for food and essentials. Uh, they can leave for exercise also, and for medical appointments, or caring for the vulnerable. And even then, I've seen some videos where the police have been harassing people caring for the vulnerable. Now, you know what's going to happen there? Every person in their dog is going to dig out their tracksuit from the deep storage and go running. And I reckon you should. And don't forget, winter draws on. So... Special attention has to be given to the vulnerable and those over 60. And once again, they're being advised to minimise their social contacts, but there's going to be no return of a formal request to shield themselves. And government insiders, they also said that time-limited measures would then see a return to a regionalised approach. Now, in another major reversal, the original furlough scheme, under which the state paid 80% of workers' wages, is also going to be uh, extended for the duration of the new lockdown, even though ministers um, had been resisting an extension of the scheme previously. And the lockdown won't be applied to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. However, they bring England into alignment with France and Germany by imposing nationwide restrictions, almost as severe as a global economy earlier on in the year, um, with its uh, deepest recession, uh, you know, like uh, seen so far. So the United Kingdom has reported 46,000 COVID deaths as those uh, dying within 28 days of, uh, you know, COVID tests. But once again, I'm just reporting what they're claiming, but we're seeing a hell of a lot to contradict it. In Germany, they've got 600 really high-level doctors who have come out also speaking against it, and they're saying that it's a hoax too. So we've got to win the hearts and minds of the people who... Uh, I sound really nasally. I think my glasses <laughs> block my... Nose one two so yeah <coughs> we've got to win the hearts and the minds of the people and try and get people to understand that listen regardless people die all the time is a flu around people are dying as they always do carry on as normal if they publish the figures every day of people who died of cancer of the common cold or people who just fell off a of ladders you wouldn't think that the world was a safe place and you'd have the same reaction as now it's nothing to worry about so if the figures were actually correct as reported by the way the united kingdom has the world's fifth largest official death toll uh which only comes after united states brazil india and mexico <laughs> boom in fifth place this week in the corona charts <laughs> the united kingdom so we don't know who to believe, and in my view, they realise the effect of the previous scares, 
such as bird flu and all the you know other scares that they done each year. And what that moved them to construct was this pandemic nonsense. And to on top of all of this nonsense. It was announced today that the UK's terror threat level has been raised from substantial to severe, meaning an attack is now uh, imminent or judged to be highly likely. And as Pretty Patel says, the British public should be alert but not alarmed. Then she confirmed there would now be more visible policing across the country. What the hell are they up to? It's about getting police on the street. That's all it is. Terrorist threat, my ass. I don't know, but you can bet your last pound it's no good. <laughs> anyway... Okay, so don't forget, tune in to part two next week. We'll be talking about the key plays in the Great Reset, uh, UK's vaccine task force, Agenda 21, suicide rates, boredom, and what we're going to do about it, along with some other stuff. So, let's see who's in the room. Thanks for coming in tonight. Um, you guys have been amazing, and I've been the OBG. I don't think people really know the true hypnotic power of television and you know how it pulls us in and just keeps telling us to consume buy, buy, buy and tells us to hate each other and separates us and causes the greatest divides all under the name of entertainment and every time I turn on my TV it's just like no surprise it's all of those programs and they're pushing out lies and in between there's the adverts and they do it again and they're trying to convince us that we're friends and they have us trained like good little soldiers one Watch it again in slow motion. Watch it again in slow motion. Watch it again in slow motion. Watch it again in slow motion.